Uh, thanks very much, uh, Daryl. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the work you've put on in uh, putting together the conference. But most of all, thanks to you all for coming. I'm very, very excited about what could happen today as a result of the group of people that are gathered here. I interpret it as a sign that things are changing in the church in relation to attitudes to animals. I think we're at a tipping point. And I think that those of us gathered here could be part of a vanguard that is the catalyst for provoking a new understanding about the place of animals in Christianity. I'm really looking forward to the conversations we're going to have during the course of the day, and even more, looking forward to what we agree to do as a result. Animals. Who cares? I think often, the ta often it seems like no one is the answer to that question. I think if you look at the unprecedented scale of the needless cruelties that we visit on farmed animals, uh, you would uh, take the clear impression that the, the societies which endorse that way of treating animals must uh, care nothing at all for the well-being of uh, non-human animals. And I, I don't know, need to go into the detail of those uh, manifest uh, cruelties. I'm sure they're uh, familiar to uh, many of you. Um, I myself have been to visit uh, industrial scale broiler facilities uh, and other sites of intensive farming and have been appalled at the cruelties inflicted on animals in those contexts. But we need to put that alongside another answer to the question, animals, who cares, which is pretty much everyone. If you look at the content of uh, many Facebook feeds, it seems to be, uh, when it's not about Donald Trump, it's pretty much all fluffy pictures of kittens. If you look at the amount of resource that uh, people invest in caring for companion animals, uh, both financial and in terms of their time, uh, if you look at how much money people give to animals-related charities, uh, it seems like the concern for animals is very, very widespread. If we look around and ask what organizations are prominent in caring for animals, I think the organizations which might come to mind are those that seem to have a secular uh, uh, ethos. As I'll say in a minute, RSPCA wasn't secular in its origins, uh, but I think people would recognize it primarily now as a secular organization. And certainly PETA, uh, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, uh, you know, gets lively uh, coverage in relation to various campaigns on a secular basis. Uh, I would guess that many of the people who are persuaded to care about animals uh, are inspired by the atheistic utilitarianism of Peter Singer or the animal rights, secular animal rights theories of Tom Regan or Gary Francioni. Uh, I think those are the prominent voices uh, in terms of concern for animals in the culture uh, that we find around us. But then what about Christians? Now, of course, uh, uh, you'll, you, like me, you'll know many Christians who have uh, strong uh, concern about uh, animals, uh, just like everyone else. But what's really striking is that animals are not prominent in terms of the concerns of uh, the churches that uh, I'm uh, a member of, that you uh, may well be members of too. I think few Christians think about concern for animals as a faith issue. I think we tend to think about concern for animals in the same kind of category as soap operas or Game of Thrones or football or your favorite guilty pleasure of choice. We love them, we're concerned about them passionately, but we often don't make the connections between our enthusiasm for them and our faith. We don't often expect to hear about them in church. So we confess faith in Jesus Christ and we love animals, but we don't often put them together. So my diagnosis is that care among Christians for animals 
is disenfranchised. Care among Christians for animals is disenfranchised. It's there, but we don't think we have permission for it from our faith or the churches we belong to. And perhaps that's what brings some of us here, feeling strongly that, we need to be, that we're concerned about treating animals well, but puzzled about how that fits with our faith. And more puzzled that other Christians don't seem to feel the same. For some people, that puts them on the fringes of the church. For some people, that makes them give up on the church altogether. Perhaps that's you, or perhaps that's someone you know. And this situation seems very odd to me, because there are such strong biblical and theological reasons to care about animals, And it's abundantly clear that Christians in the past have seen concern for animals as fundamentally belonging to their faith and have acted in response. So I used to think that I was just a Christian who happened to be concerned about animals. But now I think that it was my Christian upbringing and formation that led me into feeling compassionate in relation to animals, and that concern for animals is a fundamental part of my Christian discipleship. There's a connection both ways. So I think we need to reconnect Christian faith with concern for animals. I've spent most of the last 10 years working on this in my academic life, and I won't bore you with all of that now, though do visit the bookstore. But here's how I'd summarise the case that Christianity and animals are strongly linked, that Christians have strong faith-based reasons to care about animals, and so animals should feature more strongly in the concerns of our churches And this is material that will be familiar to uh, many of you and is well covered in many of the uh, literature you'll find on the stand and uh, in the uh, materials that many of the organizations have brought uh, uh, today. Uh, But just in summary, the Bible gives us very strong reasons to believe that God is the creator of all creaturely life, animals, uh, uh, human and non-human, alongside all other creatures. Uh, God created them uh, good And God exercises providential care over all of created uh, life. Uh, You'll remember the closing chapters of Job, where Job is confronted with God speaking out of the whirlwind, making clear that Job is just one small part in God's magnificent work of uh, creation. Uh, And God's favorite creatures, Behemoth and Leviathan, uh, don't look altogether friendly towards uh, human beings. This great Psalm 104, gives a, a creation psalm, gives a magnificent picture of God's ordered creation in which human beings are one important part among uh, many. And many of the psalms discuss the way that uh, God opens God's hand to provide for every living creature. So we worship a God who created uh, animal uh, creatures along with everything else, declared them good, uh, and cares for them uh, providentially and intimately on a daily basis according to Scripture. But Scripture goes further than that. When the writers of the letters to the Ephesians and the Colossians tried to picture the immensity of the work of Jesus Christ, uh, they reached again and again for the phrase in Greek, tapanta, all things. Jesus Christ reconciles all things in heaven and earth. Uh, So the work of Christ is not merely human in scope, according to the New Testament text. It's cosmic in scope. It includes all creatures. And and in the Bible, we're heir to visions of a reconciliation and a redemption of all creatures. Uh, uh, So humans and non-human animals living in peace, pictured uh, uh, in the origins at the beginning of Genesis, pictured in prophetic texts, pictured in uh, Paul's uh, Romans 8, where he talks about the whole of creation liberated from its bondage. So... The Bible gives us very strong reasons to think that animals should be a focal Christian concern. And the kind of texts that get wheeled out uh, to question that, uh, that human beings are uniquely made in the image of God and are called to have dominion over other creatures according to Genesis 1, 
Uh, As I read those texts, those are reasons to be more concerned about the lives of other animals rather than less. If we are to image the gracious God that we worship, that imaging cannot be any kind of exploitative relationship in relation to uh, other animals. If we have a particular capacity to have dominion, that kind of dominion must be the kind of dominion that's trying to be a gracious presence in relation to all other uh, animal life. If we move on from uh, the Bible to uh, Christian theological tradition, it's really striking to me that one of the primary arguments that Christian theologians were having in the first centuries of the Christian church was arguing against uh, opponents later judged to be heretics that creation was good. So in the thought world, there was the idea that this is a pretty nasty place. Creation is a place that's evil and lots of nasty things happen. And if only we could escape this awful materiality to some pure spiritual realm, we'd be fine. And you can still find examples of that kind of heresy, I think, in the churches uh, today. But Christian theologians argued against that view. They said, no, this whole thing is the creation of a good God, the good God that we worship. And so Augustine argued with his uh, uh, critics about the goodness of created uh, life. It's true that Christian theologians did uh, make alliances and draw, I think, unwisely on particular aspects of Greek philosophy that drew strong uh, boundaries between human and non-human life on the the basis of rationality and other supposedly unique uh, human characteristics. But if we engage constructively with uh, those kinds of arguments, as I and uh, many others uh, have uh, done, I I think we can demonstrate that we can have a good argument with those sources and show, knowing what we know now, those arguments aren't plausible uh, as good accounts of a Christian theological understanding of uh, other animals. Uh, If we move on uh, to uh, spirituality, uh, you'll be familiar, I'm sure, with many, many stories Uh, that are collected about the Christian saints that make clear that compassion for human beings must inevitably spill over into the rest of creation if we're to have a proper understanding of what true Christian holiness uh, means. So that story is about uh, St. Macarius and the hyena who takes a hyena's pup and heals uh, a blind pup uh, and sends uh, the hyena away rejoicing. Uh, that's uh, stories about uh, like St. Werberg in my city of Chester uh, who uh, resurrects a goose that her steward has killed for the table and sends uh, the flock, away, uh, flock of geese away uh, happy. That story about St. Godric where I used to live in Durham Uh, who uh, gives shelter. I think he's the first uh, hunt saboteur. He gives shelter to a stag who seeks refuge at his hermitage. Uh, And when the Prince Bishop arrives with his hunt uh, uh, and is asked where the stag is, St. Godric says, God knows where he is. Uh, And what strikes me is that Christians have collected, gathered, and treasured those stories as to what it means to be holy in a Christian context. So understandings of Christian spirituality are fundamentally about recognizing compassion beyond the human realm. But then finally, in relation to history, uh, I think not enough Christians are aware that Christians in the 19th century were among the most prominent voices uh, uh, in favor of the first anti-cruelty legislation in Britain, uh, and then opposing the awful cruelties of vivisection without anesthetic in the ni- at the end of the 19th century. So the church has an honorable history of being at the forefront of concern for animals uh, that I think we need to uh, recapture. So for all these reasons, for the Bible, spirituality, uh, theology, and history, I think we need to recognize that Christians have strong faith-based reasons to seek the flourishing of all animal creatures. Animals, who cares? Given the unprecedented cruelties we're currently inflicting on farmed animals in intensive systems, it seems to me urgent to reclaim the connection between concern for animals and Christian faith and be in the vanguard of campaigns to resist production systems that have no regard for the flourishing of animals. If you're one of those that shares this view, and I take it that you are, I think we need to get together to take this conversation out to our sisters and brothers in Christ in the wider church. 
That's why I founded the organization CreatureKind uh, a year ago, which is a new organization seeking to engage Christians with farmed animal welfare as a faith concern. We've got some great ideas how to, about how to do this. We're engaging Christian institutions with setting targets to reduce the uh, consumption of animals uh, within them and move to higher welfare uh, sourcing. We've developed uh, um, uh, a social media presence website and a blog at becreaturekind.org. Do have a look at it. But most excitingly for me today, we are launching a new free six-week online course on Christianity and animals that we hope will be a significant resource for Christians to take out this conversation to the wider church. I've piloted this in my own church and we had a wonderful series of conversations where we had a simple meal, uh, vegan meal um, uh, to start uh, and then we had some wonderful conversations about where animals belong in our faith, how does that match up to what we're currently doing to them and what as a church would we like to do in response. But we need your help to run that in the church communities that you are part of. Uh, So do look out for that. Find the resources uh, for it. Come to my workshop this afternoon if you want to uh, hear more. Animals. Who cares? The answer is that we do. All of us. All of us gather today, and so do many of our fellow Christians. And now is the time to help people make connections between their faith and their concern for animals in order to respond to the urgent challenge of the cruelties we're, inflicted on, we're inflicting on farmed animals. So the stores downstairs make clear the many other organizations working alongside CreatureKind, uh, many of whom with much longer histories than ours to take forward this work. So let's talk. Let's reflect together on how to take the energy in this room out to the church at large, and let's make Christianity good news for animals. Thank you. Thank you.